We're continuing in our spiritual warfare series. Um, today we're we're going to take a, a, another little uh, a little side trip as we look at the um, at the armor of God, Ephesians six ten. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against have flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickednesses in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Paul's encouraging us to put on the whole armor, not just part of it, and that this armor is spiritual because we're engaged in spiritual warfare. The purpose of the armor is to help us, enable us, not just help us, but enable us to stand against the wiles, the trickery, the deceit, the schemes of the devil. And our warfare is not to be conducted against people in the physical domain, the flesh and blood, but it's we're, we're fighting against spiritual beings and spiritual powers. It's very clear in this that that's where our warfare is. The best place to fight against spiritual hosts of wickednesses is in heavenly places, because these spiritual hosts of wickednesses are in the second heaven. The best place for us to fight them is to fight them from above, from the third heaven, from our position seated with Christ in heavenly places. The purpose of the armor is to allow us to withstand or stand against in evil days. So we can look at our the life, the, the play, time we're living right now, and many can see some of the things that are going on and say, we are living in evil days. So putting on the armor will allow us to stand in the midst of evil days and to stand against these spiritual forces of wickedness. It's not possible for me to overemphasize the reality this passage is talking about. It's talking about spiritual warfare. It's not a, a, an example. It's not, it's not just language that we can use to say, well, what he's really talking about, and then just talk about things in the physical realm. We have to be careful not to be a not to be lured into reduction and a, a reductionist position where we reduce what Paul is talking about, which is spiritual warfare against spiritual beings, to the manifestations of that warfare in the physical realm. That what we're really fighting against is disease and those kinds of things in the physical realm. Yes, we want to heal the sick and we want to be involved in bringing people's lives to betterment. We obviously want to do that. But we have to constantly remind ourselves that if we don't fight the battle, the spiritual warfare in the spiritual realm, it will be very difficult for us to be effective in our ministry. Many people in ministry fight the battle in the physical realm. And they get tired and burned out and worn out. What we want to do is while we're walking in the physical realm, while we're ministering to people, while we're helping people, while we're loving people, our battle is in the spirit realm. Ephesians 6, 14, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the evil one, of the wicked one. So today we're going to begin talking about the shield of faith that allows us to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. When Paul was talking about the armor of God, he was relating it to the armor that Roman soldiers would wear because that's what was in front of everyone and that's what people in his day thought. There were two types of shields that Roman soldiers used. One was looked a metal round about the size of a large pizza and the other was much larger rectangular, about four and a half feet high with semicircular cross section. This is the one that's in the picture. This is the shield that Paul defined as part of God's armor. The Romans called this shield the scutum. The scutum was built with two layers of wood strips, similar to plywood, 
laid at right angles to each other and heated so that they could be pressed into a semicircle shape. After the shield was formed, it was covered with six layers of animal hide and had a handle on the inside for the soldier to grasp. So that's a little details about the shield. Before we go into the shield of faith and how it works, we first, I think it first would be good for us to talk a little bit about what we mean when we say faith. So I'm going to go through some things to share with you, some things that I discovered, and hopefully you'll find them helpful to you, not just in applying the shield of faith, but in understanding and applying faith to your life overall. Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines faith this way. First, it's an allegiance or du to duty or to a person. So faith is this defined as loyalty, fidelity to one's promises, sincerity of intentions. He acted in good faith. So this is kind of the first way that, that we as human beings look at what faith is. There's a loyalty component. There's a fidelity that if you make a promise, you're faithful to keep those promises. You will do them. Your word is good. And that you're actions are sincere are sincere all of these are part of someone being faithful or having faith the second definition is belief and trust in and loyalty to god and then webster breaks those that down belief in traditional doctrines of a religion so it could be any religion not any one particular, but if you have belief in those doctrines, if you have a firm belief in something for which there is no proof, and the example they gave was clinging to the faith that her missing son would one day return. So when we talk about faith in the world, many people see it this way. I have faith in something, I'm going to cling to it, and I'm going to believe in it, even though I don't have any evidence or any real reason uh, to believe in it. So this is firm belief in something with which there is no proof. Okay, and that's another way people talk about faith. It's interesting that belief in doctrines and firm belief in something that there is no proof are put together in the Webster Dictionary for one of the definitions of faith, belief and trust and, and loyalty to God. Those things were kind of grouped together along with complete trust. So if you have faith, you have complete trust in those things that you have faith in. The last definition in Webster's was something that is believed, especially with strong conviction, especially a system of religious beliefs, such as the Protestant faith. So you collect a bunch of, of things, a bunch of doctrines or beliefs or system, and you can call that faith. So you might have a Protestant faith, or if you're involved in a, um, a biker gang, you might have a biker gang's faith, that you accept that with strong conviction, the set of convictions, beliefs, and the system that goes along with that. So this is how the Webster Dictionary defines faith. And, and, and I would say that probably most people in the world, if you ask them about faith, what they would describe would fall into one of these three categories. Allegiance, fidelity, sincerity, belief, trust, and loyalty, or a system that you believe in, a faith system that you believe in. And whether they believe in God, whether they, they're saying I have faith in God or I have faith in uh, I have faith in my government, I have faith in this organization that I'm part of, I have faith that these things that I have collected around me to uh, that I call what I the things I believe in, I have faith that those things are true. Whichever it might be, if you question them and talk to them everything that they would say would fall into one of these categories, 
or most of the things they would say would fall into one of these categories. So now I want to go and take a look at faith from a the perspective of Christianity and, and also look at what the word is, the word actually means. So the word faith in Greek is the word pistis. It means faith, belief, firm persuasion. So I've got a few a few definitions here. One is uh, I gave you the one from Strong's Greek Dictionary. So if you use Strong's Concordance, you'll get uh, faith is, that that faith. The word pistis is the word pistis. This is what's always used, and it means faith, belief, firm persuasion. If you look at Thayer's Greek Dictionary, he has a little bit more to say. He says it's a conviction of the truth of anything, a belief in the New Testament of a conviction or belief respecting man's relationship to God and divine things, generally with the included idea of trust and holy fervor born of faith and joined with it. So Thayer is looking, he says, well, from a Christian perspective, from a New Testament perspective, faith is relates to things of man's relationship with God and divine things that are revealed perhaps in scripture and there's trust there, and there's an excitement or a, a holy fer fervor uh, that comes along with it. Um, Moulton and Milligan, in the vocabulary of the Greek New Testament, they have a few things to say. They said, faith is the confidence in a person, such as a witness in a legal process or trial. Now, Moulton and Milligan, when they look at the vocabulary of the Greek Testament, they tend to look outside of the Bible. They look at what other people were saying about words in, in that time period. And, and they say, okay, this is when somebody used the word faith, if they were Greek or they were using Greek, this is what they were thinking of. So if someone was going to be a witness in a legal process or a trial, then you would want to have faith that what they said was true. And you would have, want to have confidence in that person before you would bring them up, before you would bring them up to give a testimony or to be a witness you would have faith, confidence in that person that what they're going to say is true and accurate. So that's, you'd have faith in that person. The person is trustworthy, fidelity, we've seen that. If you have faith in a person or faith in a situation or faith in an organization, you would consider that to be trustworthy. Um, and the other part, which is interesting, is faith also described a guarantee or a pledge such in as, as in a contract. So when you signed a contract, you would have signed the contract in good faith that you would be able to fulfill that bond or fulfill that mortgage. And when you sign the contract, you would be signing in good faith that the person that was giving you the mortgage or giving you the money had the capacity to do that, that they actually own the property. So the, the, faith, the word faith was used in, those, in that kind of contractual language. Vine's Expository Dic Dictionary says faith is a firm persuasion, a conviction based on hearing, trust, assurance, and acknowledgement. So these are some of the things that, that you hear if you go into the Greek dictionaries and, and, and look and see you know, what this word actually means. The New Dictionary of Theology, which is more theologically oriented than just the definition of words mean, uh, oriented, uh, when it talks about faith, it says, says faith is about stepping forward, not into the darkness, but into the light. In the fifth century, faith is mysterious, mysteriously both a divine gift and an uncoerced human activity. So faith is something that's given to you, but faith is also something that you participate in without coercion. You do it willingly. You do it out of your own will. It's related to both assent and trust. So when you do something in faith, then you assent to it. You're not going to do something in faith that you don't agree with or that you don't that you don't step into uncoerced. So many people would be coerced by their religion. Let's say that you know um, I'll give you an example. When the Muslims came through, they forced everybody to convert to their faith to Islam, not because they were uncoerced or they did it because they wanted to, but because it's how they would survive. That, that is not consistent with the definition of faith and what faith traditionally meant. Traditionally, faith always points beyond itself to that which is believed. So when we say we have faith in something, 
we're pointing, that language points towards the something, not to ourselves. More liberal perspective in theology, faith is a manner of judgment. So you judge things faithfully based on what you see. Genuine relational faith is expressed in ethical behavior. So if you have faith, you behave that way. And this kind of ties into the James passage where it says, faith without works is dead. If your actions are different than what you proclaim to believe in or to have faith in, then you don't really have faith in that stuff at all. Now, John Wesley, in one of his sermons, this is one of his standard sermons that every Methodist preacher in the early days had to preach word for word as Wesley wrote it, a sermon called Justification by Faith. And here's a couple of things that he said in that sermon. He said, faith is a sure trust and confidence that God has and will forgive our sins, that he has accepted us again into his favor for merits of Christ's death and passion. So Wesley focuses on what God has done. And then he says, faith is a sure trust and confidence that this stuff that God has done is accurate and true. We believe that God did this. We believe that God will forgive us of our sins, and he has forgiven us of our sins. We believe that God will accept us again into his favor because of Jesus' death and his passion. So faith is a sure trust and confidence. Also, he said, faith is a divine supernatural evidence or conviction of things not seen, not discoverable by our bodily senses as being either past, future, or spiritual. So in these two sentences, John Wesley gives us the two components of faith. He says, faith is, a, is part of our soul. It's a sure trust and confidence. This is something that comes out of our will, out of our mind, out of our emotions, comes out of our soul life. Our soul life has faith because it has trust and confidence that something is true. But there's another component that's supernatural evidence or conviction of things not seen, not discoverable by bodily senses. This is an interesting thing because he's not saying you have faith in things that you, that you can't see. He's saying that you have evidence and conviction of things that you can't see, and they can't be discovered by your bodily senses. So this part of the definition of faith goes beyond the body soul life you can't have this component of faith supernatural evidence or conviction of not seen you cannot have that as a body soul person because it's not discover you can't discover the evidence if your body if your body if it if they can't be discovered by your bodily senses you can't really discover them if you can't discover them by an action of your mind, you can't discover them. So this is not saying that you can't come to a conviction in your mind that some of these supernatural things are true. It's not saying that you can, and that's part of the first. Faith is a sure confidence, sure trust and confidence, because you're having a trust and confidence that God has, has done things and God will do things and that we will be accepted. All of those things are things that you can't also can't prove with your physical senses but you can come to that sure trust and confidence as an act of your will, an act of your mind, an act of your emotions. You can say, yes, this is what I believe. This is what I have faith in. But the second part, this supernatural evidence that you can't discover by your body, bodily senses, this supernatural evidence of, or conviction of things unseen is not something that your mind can just come to. It's something that requires supernatural involvement in your life. There has to be a supernatural component or spiritual component for this. This is something that's either past, future, or spiritual, something that happened before. How do you have evidence of that? Something that's going to happen in the future, how do you have evidence of that? Something that is spiritual, how do you have evidence of that? So he's not talking about um, this type, this component of faith being something that you conclude by mental process, he's saying this is something that you accept by evidence and by conviction. So let's hold on to that because we're going to talk about that in more detail.
We're going to look at three parts of Hebrews 11 um, to kind of flesh this out. So we're first we're going to look at the first four verses, and then we'll look at a few more, and then some down in 23. So Hebrews 11, 1. I'm going to read all of them now, and then we'll go through them piece by piece. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders attained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, to which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his, of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Then down, down to verse 30, 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of the Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of kings, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So let's look at these. First, Hebrews 11.1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The word substance here means setting under or support. It's something that supports everything. It has a concrete essence. It means substance, substructure, foundation, real being, confidence. So when we talk about the substance of things hoped for, we're talking about something that is real and is experienced as real and substantial uh, it's it's like the foundation of your home. It's like a, a, a chair. It's like a concrete pillar. It's something solid. It has substance to it. It's real. So faith is the substance of things hoped for. Walter Bauer. This is one of the most the, one of the um, uh, leading references for people that stu study Greek, Greek lexicon, and New Testament. Um, he talked about substance, the substantial nature or essence, actual being reality, often contrasted by what, by what merely seems to be. So if you look at the Greek philosophers, they would use this word substance, hypostatus, as a way of contrasting things that people would say were true, but turned out not to be, or things that people would say were real, but turned out not to be real. And they were talking about philosophy and about what they considered to be spiritual things. And they would say, this is substantial, this is real, and these other things are not. So that's kind of interesting that the word substance was talking about when the Greek philosophers and their religious people used this word, they were referring to things that were, in, that were real, that were part of reality, not something that just seemed to be real. Okay, so that's, that's important that that's, that's what this word is used for. It's used for situations, a conditions, a frame of mind, or a frame of reference. So when you're looking out at things and you're looking at it from a frame of reference, that frame of reference provide, provides a substance for how you understand things. 2 Corinthians 9, 4 and eleven seventeen, 17, Hebrews 3, 14, it talks about sub, this substance as being part of your confidence. Hebrews 1, 3 talks about things which are seen which are made from the invisible. So this things that are seen are made from the invisible. The invisible is substance. The things that are seen are made from that which is substantial, but not visible. That's important for us to remember. So when we say we believe that God created the universe, he spoke it into existence or he created out of nothing. We're saying that that 
substance of God's voice, the substance of God that created it, is more real than the things that came as a result of him speaking. So when God said, let there be light, the substance of light existed in God before he spoke it into existence in the physical realm. Okay, so that's what substance is talking about. It's reality, but sometimes reality that's behind what we see. In hope, we are called on in history to look for something to emerge in the future. We're hoping for something to happen in the future. In faith, the substance of that thing is perceived as real and substantial in the presence and beyond. So when we say, I hope that something is going to happen next week, we're projecting that hope and that thing that we're, we're, we're hoping for it's going to happen in the future. And we're going to be talking about this a little bit more. But when we say, I believe that something is going to happen next week, when we use the word believe or I have faith that something is going to happen next week, we have evidence in the present that next week it will happen. We have evidence we perceive that it is already real. That's what faith means. Substantial means that that which we perceive by faith is solid within reality at the moment. It's thick as a brick. So I would say that when I perceive something in faith, that thing that I'm perceiving that I'm talking about is as solid as the chair that I'm sitting on. Hopefully you're sitting on a good chair. It's as solid as the foundation of my house. It's as solid as the pillars that hold up the freeway. It's substantial already. And if you're using the word faith for something that doesn't have that substance to it, then you're really talking about hope, not faith. Now, I'm saying this, and I'm going through this in a lot of detail, because I want you to understand that for many of us, including myself, I used the word hate, I used the word faith in the past for something that I should have used the word hope for, because I didn't have any substance, I didn't have any evidence that it was true. But I wanted it to be true, and based on some precept, some teaching in scripture, or based on experience with God, I said, I have believe it will happen, I have faith that it will happen. That's hope. I have hope that something will happen because of that. So let's look at that in more detail. Romans 8, 24, for we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope in what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray, for we ought, but this, for, what, for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercessions for us, with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. So in the Hebrews passage, we're looking at faith as the substance of thing hoped for. Hope is about confidence in the historical reality of the past that will impact what we are looking for in the future. For example, Jesus healed in the past. We can look at scripture. Jesus healed in scripture. We can look at people that we prayed for a month ago. Jesus healed them. So Jesus healed in the past. Therefore, we have confidence that he can and will heal in the future. And we hope that we will see it with our physical eyes, these things which are not, real, are not yet realized. So often when we pray for someone, we pray in hope, which is a very powerful thing. It's based on who Jesus is, what he's done, and what we've experienced, and we're hoping that God will now do the same for the person we're praying for. That's hope. That's not faith. That's hope. And it's very powerful, and, it's, and, it, and it, it, it brings tremendous results. In hope, we wait and persevere until we see it. So I'm using the word see in two ways here. I'm, more, I'm using the word see in terms of seeing things that are physical and seeing things are invisible because it says in Romans 8 
why does one still hope for what he sees? Now, when people read that, they think immediately what you see with your physical eyes. But Paul doesn't say that. He says, why would we hope for what for something that we've already seen? So I just want to put that out there that when we pray and hope, that means we don't we haven't seen the result with our physical eyes, we haven't seen the result with our spiritual eyes, but we have confidence because of what Jesus has done. And we're going to him and say, Jesus, I know you've healed. I've seen you heal. Will you heal this person when we pray for healing? That's praying in hope. And the Holy Spirit is interceding with us in the midst of this, according to the will of God. There's groaning in the spirit. The, the God is participating. We participate by praying in tongues. There's more to know about how this intercession in the spirit works. Because when we're praying in hope, we may not have any more words than just, Lord, will you heal this person? And then we enter into the spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to intercede. So I'm talking about this because for many years, I had the misconception that because I had faith that Jesus heals, I have evidence from scripture and evidence from my own experience that he does heal. Then I had to have faith that he would heal without seeing it at all. And I equated seeing it to my physical eyes, so I would call that faith. But Paul is calling it hope. Let's continue. Back to Hebrews 11. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The word evidence, elegachos, is a proof that by which a thing is proved or tested, conviction in what is received. So if you're in a court case and somebody presents evidence, they have to present something that proves their argument something that's been tested, you can't present as evidence that doesn't relate to the case or evidence that doesn't mean anything. It has to be, it has to prove something. So when we, when we look at evidence in our, in this case, we're, we're not talking about something that somebody just brings out and says, well, this is evidence that is true. And it turns out the evidence is not solid or not real. We're talking about evidence that proves or tests and brings conviction about what's been received. So when we're looking at evidence of things not seen, I'm going to give you a couple different perspectives. The first perspective is what for many, many, many years was my perspective. And the second perspective is what I've come to uh, more recently. I don't know if you guys know who Francis Schaeffer is. Francis Schaeffer is a, was a Presbyterian minister who wrote many books, fantastic pastor, fantastic minister, and started a ministry in Europe when he saw that Christianity was losing steam in Europe. He started a ministry in Europe, and it was basically a ministry where people could come in and talk philosophically and theologically about Jesus and about God and about religion. They could just go to this house and hang out, and that's, that's, that's what Francis Schaeffer established, and he wrote a bunch of books that talked about the God who is there, the God who's not silent, to combat what was being said in the philosophical realm, in the religious realm. Francis Schaeffer tells this story when he talks about faith. He tells a story to demonstrate what faith is. And before I tell you the story, I'm just going to say to you, when I read this story, I agreed with it completely, and it gave me great um, comfort that this description was describing what I accepted as faith in a way that I was having trouble finding words for. So I'm not going to quote the story exactly, but I'm going to paraphrase it. So there was this, this uh, person, young man, and he was in Switzerland. And Francis Schaeffer, by the way, set up his places in Switzerland. So he's talking about, he's pointing to the mountains around him as he's telling the story. Um, so he came to Switzerland and he went hiking in the mountains. And he had water and he had clothing and he had, you know, good shoes. And he went hiking up the mountain and he was hiking up one 
mountain and there was a valley and there was another mountain. It was a relatively narrow valley. So the other mountain on the other side was very relatively close to him. So he's hiking up the mountain and he's going through all these switchbacks and he notices that it's kind of a treacherous walk, but he's confident. He has his walking stick. He has his good shoes and he's confident walking up the mountain. He can see the path clearly, but it's cut right in the side of the mountain. On one side is the mountain. On the other side, nothing. There's no rails. There's no safety. I mean, it's if you slipped and fell, you would die. And he climbs up the mountain. He's having a good time and he gets up kind of close to the top and he feels really confident and great in what he did. But he stayed a little too long and the fog comes in. And so he sees the fog is coming in. He starts going down, but the fog comes in faster than he thought. And he has to stop because now the fog has completely covered him and he can't see even five feet ahead of him. He can't, he can barely see his hand when he holds it out in front of his face. And so he's sitting on the mountain and this fog is and he goes, well, it's too treacherous and dangerous for me to try to walk down this path when I can't see. So I'm just going to wait. But what he doesn't re realize is that the, with the fog comes the cold air of the mountains and the temperature starts dropping rapidly. And now he realizes that he's in serious trouble, that he probably will die up here in the mountain He's either going to die by trying to going down and falling off, or he's going to die by hypothermia, and he realizes he's in serious trouble. And so he starts calling out, help. He starts calling help, help, help. And then he hears a voice from over on the, the other side of the mountain. And the voice says, what's the problem? And he says, I'm, I'm stuck here. I can't see. The fog is thick. I know the, the, the path behind me is treacherous. I went on this treacherous path, and, and I don't. I, I know there were places that were very narrow and, and the footing was very tricky and I don't know what to do and I'm, it's getting cold and I'm afraid I'm going to die. And the man from the other side says, well, here's what you should do. Put your hand on the side of the mountain, walk down about 15 steps and then jump. But jump, go to, go to the edge and jump and you'll land down about four feet down and from there on down, the path is very thick, very wide. And so you can just put your hand on the side of the mountain and walk the rest of the way down. There's no narrow parts. There's no tricky parts. And so this guy is sitting there going, I hear this voice. It's telling me, go down 10 steps, go to the edge and jump. And I'll be safe. Who is this guy? Why should I believe him? And so he starts asking questions. He says, who are you? And the guy says, my name is John Anderson. He says, why should I believe you? And he says, well, my family has lived on these mountains for the last five generations. I was brought, my father, my grandfather was brought up in these mountains walking these trails. I was, my dad was brought up in these mountains walking these trails. I was brought up in the mountain walking these trails. He says, why should I believe this? He says, well, let me tell you about some things you've experienced. And he started describing the trail. He described the village below. And he's describing things that the, that the person had reference to. And so now the person's going, okay. He says he's John Anderson. He gives me some support. He's been on this path many times. He's been stuck in the fog many times. He knows the area. His family has been here for, four, for at least four generations, five generations. So what am I going to do? Am I going to trust him and do what he says? And so the person realizes that if he doesn't do this, he's either going to walk down the mountain, like down the path and try, but there's some really treacherous places and he might slip and fall and die, or he's going to stay where he's at and freeze. So those are his three alternatives, stay and freeze. Watch, walk down the treacherous path and maybe make it and maybe not make it. Or listen to what John Anderson said, walk down a little bit and jump. And so he weighs the alternatives and he weighs the evidence that John Anderson presented him verbally. And so he walks down 10 steps, he goes to the edge and he jumps. And Francis Schaeffer says, that is what faith is. Faith is acting based on reliable evidence that you've been given. Evidence that you can't see, 
but it's reliable based on things that you already know. So for me, that was a revelation. That was a revelation of what faith was because I used the term, but I didn't really know what it was and I didn't really understand it. And so this helped me understand what faith was, a sure trust and confidence in my soul based on things that I hear and things that I see. So I can say, well, I read scripture and I hear the word of God and I have experience in the experience of church people that went before me. So all of that stuff put together allows me to have faith in God and believe in Jesus. And that really is the way our soul works. That's the faith component of our soul, a sure trust and confidence. But it doesn't help us understand the second part, which is seeing reality that is invisible to physical eyes, evidence that is invisible, revelation. So when I read evidence of things not seen, I can read that two ways. I can read it the way Francis Schaeffer kind of informs me that I have evidence. I don't see the things, but I have evidence in the Bible and in the testimony of others. I have evidence, and so therefore I choose to have faith. Or I can say, I can look at this and say, no, this is evidence of things that I can't even see. And unless I can see them, they can't be substantial. So there's kind of two ways I can look at this. One is this, the fog in Switzerland way, and the other is actual, actually seeing reality that's invisible to the physical eyes. Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that the, words, that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So it says, by faith, we understand it. Well, how can we understand that? How can we understand that things that we see in the physical realm were made of things which are invisible, things that we can't see? Part of that understanding is based on our sure trust and confidence in the word of God. But that doesn't quite get us all the way there. It gets us most of the way there. And for many of us, we'll say, yes, I believe this because the Bible says so and the Bible's reliable. And that's where we are. But part of this understanding is based on non-physical sight, because it says things which were seen were made of things, were not made of things which are visible. So there's two parts. And this kind of remind, reminds us of what John Wesley said back when we were looking at Wesley's definition of there being two parts of faith, one which is this invisible part and one which is this confidence in the things of scripture part now the word faith pistis is pistis it means persuade that is credence moral conviction assurance fidelity that's literally what the word faith means and 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 i want you to recognize it's the word pistis that's that's what that's the word in greek that's that we translate as faith hebrews 11 5 by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So this is Enoch's, this is the testimony of Enoch. He pleased God. He walked with God, and then God took him, and he never physically died. That's what we see in Scripture. And there's a lot of stuff written about Enoch that's not in Scripture, some of it which is pretty useful and helpful, some of it which is kind of wild and crazy. But this much we know. So what it says here is that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, I want you to think about that. Without faith. Whatever faith is, without it, it's impossible to please God. In order to come, to, in order, and in order to come to God, you have to believe. Believe is the worst word pistuo, which is the verb form of the noun faith. So pistio and pistis are the same word. Pistio is the verb form to believe. Pistis is the noun form faith. 
So if you say, I believe in something, and you say, I have faith in something, you're saying the same thing. In English, we're using two words, but in Greek, it's the same word. So I want you to know that because many people say, well, I have faith because I believe. And that's just like saying, well, I have faith because I have faith. It's You're saying the same thing. You're not saying anything. You're just using two different English words that are really the same word in Greek. To come to God, you must believe that he exists, believe that he is, that he exists. To come to God, you must believe that he is a rewarder. The word rewarder here means rewarder or one who pays a wage or remunerates. So a rewarder is one who gives you something because you have done something or you are someone, okay? A rewarder is not someone who just goes out and gives stuff for nothing. You know, we think of a rewarder as you come in and you say, oh, I have a reward for you. You give them a reward. They didn't do anything. That's not what the word means. The word means you've done something or you are something, and therefore you receive a reward. So to come to God, you have to believe that he's a rewarder. A rewarder to who? To those who diligently seek him. So faith, when we're talking about pleasing God, we have to have faith. And he gives us kind of two pieces that are kind of tricky. One is you have to believe that God is. You have to have faith that God exists. Remember, faith includes evidence, having evidence. So it's not just a mind state, but it also requires you to have some evidence in order for you to believe. And you must believe that he's a rewarder, that he's one who remunerates. A rewarder to who? To those who diligently seek him. Matthew 6, 33 says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So this is a passage about God being a rewarder to those who seek first the kingdom and the righteousness of God. So Matthew 6.33 helps us understand what Hebrews 6 is saying. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He's a rewarder of those who seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. That's what we were told to do. That's how we were told to seek him. Hebrews 11, 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked for the reward. By faith he forsook, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So in this passage, we see both components of faith. By faith, Moses' parents weren't afraid of the king, the, the Pharaoh, who was the most the power, he represented the power, the governmental power of Egypt, the greatest kingdom of, on earth at the time. And Moses' parents weren't afraid of that by faith. They had a confidence that God would take care of them. And so by faith, they risked their life. By faith, Moses didn't accept the honor of being the grandson of the Pharaoh. He rejected the Egyptian kingdom. He chose to be with the people of God. Okay, so he rejected the physical kingdom to chose be, to be with the people of God, which is before the kingdom of Israel was even realized. And then the last one, by faith, Moses looked for the reward. That's the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven over the treasures of Egypt that he would, he would have inherited as a grandson of Pharaoh. So Moses wasn't just some smut guy running around in Egypt. Moses was an heir of the throne. So he would have inherited the riches of Egypt. He would have been the Pharaoh, the next Pharaoh. But he rejected that because he was seeking a different kingdom. He was seeking it. So when we saw that thing about you can't please God unless you seek, Moses was seeking. 
And then verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So now we see the second component of faith kick in. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, Moses could see that which can't be seen. Let me say that again. By faith, Moses could see that which can't be seen. It says he endured in faith as seeing him who is invisible. So for many years, I would read this passage and I would miss that last part. And I would not think about, you know, Moses actually being in the presence of God and experiencing the presence of God and even seeing God's backside at once or side at one time. Moses had these rich experiences of God and God is a spirit being, not a physical being. So Moses was having interaction with a spiritual being, God. And he endured in faith because he could see that which was not seen. That's what this passage says. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. How do we make sense of that? 2 Corinthians 4.18 helps us. While we do not look at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. <clears throat> For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So faith is somehow not about just having a sure confidence in the things that we hope for and, and that becoming more and more substantial in our soul. And therefore we have faith and we can speak of those things. Faith, there's a component of faith that requires us or allows us to see things that are invisible. And we see it in Hebrews 11, and we see it in 2 Corinthians 4.18. We do not look at things which are seen. We look at things which are not seen. Because the things which we see with our physical eyes are temporary but they all came out of the things which we see with our spiritual eyes. Everything exists, exists in heavenly at first and then is manifested in the physical realm. So now we're beginning to get a flavor of this component of faith that is a spiritual thing, not a physical thing. And by spiritual thing, I mean it exists in the spirit realm and we experience it in the spirit realm. We cannot see it. We cannot comprehend it with our mind, with our soul, even with our religious mind, even with a well-trained theological mind. We cannot comprehend it. We cannot experience it with our minds, with our soul, with our heart, our emotions, our minds, our will, even our consciousness of our human existence. We cannot perceive that which is not seen. But we have a hint here. Because by faith, Moses could endure seeing him who is invisible. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us, we don't look at the things which are seen, but we're looking at the things which are not seen. 1 Corinthians 2.9. But, but as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the, th for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man, which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. This is an important passage for us because it starts off talking about what we've been Looking at in the other passages, it starts off with what's unseen and what's unheard in the physical realm. Eye has not seen, nor ear has heard. He's starting off by saying, body, soul, humans don't have any idea what we're talking about. Because they don't have eyes to see and they don't have ears to hear. They have physical eyes to see things in the physical realm. They have physical ears to hear things in the physical realm. They have a mind and a soul that can kind of comprehend those things and come up with ideas and put them all together but they cannot see these things, these unseen things. Revelation through the spirit 
is how we experience unseen things. Revelation through the spirit, because the spirit of God understands the deep things of God. The spirit of God was there when the father conceived of all of the physical nature and, and also the heavens and the earth. The spirit of God was there when Jesus spoke at them into existence. The spirit of God was stirring things up. The spirit of God knows all of this stuff. So he takes from Jesus and Jesus took from the Father, so he has complete knowledge and understanding of everything in the spirit realm. So we receive revelation through the spirit, because the spirit can, can go through the deep things of God and reveal them to the human spirit. So we see here, what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So the spirit of God takes those things and reveals it to the spirit of man who can comprehend and understand spiritual things. And then this, our human spirit communicates those things to our soul. So we, we can begin to think about it and have mental knowledge of it and understanding. So we see a spiritual component that's happening between the human spirit and the spirit of God to see unseen things to experience and know unseen things this is how you get it this is how you experience un unseen things you experience it by revelation of the holy spirit these are the mysterious things that jesus told his disciples are for us for those who are followers of jesus for those who are spirit born these things already exist in the spirit realm but are not yet physically visible. They only can be seen by revelation of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 13, 10. Disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. And in the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will not hear and shall not understand and seeing you will not perceive. So Isaiah was talking about people that could hear and see in the physical realm, but they couldn't see and hear and understand in the spiritual realm. But to the disciples, it's going to be given to them. These mysteries are going to be given to them. To those who are spirit born, whose human spirit is active, the Holy Spirit is indwelled in them, and we're connected with the spiritual kingdom. So we can see things in the spirit that are not visible. In the physical realm are not understandable in the physical realm first corinthians 2 12 now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit who is from god that we may know the things that have been freely given to us by god these things we also speak not in words in which wisdom the wisdom man's wisdom teaches but which the holy spirit teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So the things that, are, that God wants to reveal to us, he reveals to us in the Spirit, and most people, natural man, cannot understand them cannot discern them because you you receive them through the spirit and even when we talk about them those of us who can receive these things even when we talk about them the person the natural man is going to be measuring these spiritual things against his worldly knowledge against his natural knowledge and some of it makes a little bit of sense but a lot of it doesn't the holy spirit connects our human spirit to the kingdom of god in the spirit realm we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit is from God. We speak these things that are taught to us by the Holy Spirit. So when we speak, we're not speaking just words and understanding. We're not even just speaking scripture, even though we speak scripture. We're speaking scripture as it is inspired and anointed by the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is what's needed to understand and discern spiritual things. We compare spiritual things with spiritual wisdom and revelation, what we see and hear in the spirit realm from the throne of the kingdom of heaven. 
So our human spirit, because it's spirit, has the capability of measuring spiritual things with spiritual things. Our human spirit has the capability of spiritually discern things. The natural man cannot do this. He might be, he or she might be very theologically astute, might understand all of these concepts in scripture, but they still can't put it all together because they're spiritually discerned. They are unseen in the physical realm. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Spiritual things that are seen and perceived by revelation of the Holy Spirit to our human spirit from the kingdom of God. This is the spiritual element of faith. Faith is evidence of things not seen. It's not just hoping that they're true. It's having evidence of them. How do you have evidence of them? You see in the spirit. You perceive them. You measure spiritual things to spiritual things. You're receiving that revelation and you're speaking them, you're discerning them, all of that is happening in your human spirit with the Holy Spirit. So this part of faith is not possible for someone who isn't spirit-born. They may use the word faith, and they may use the language of faith, but it's not possible, because faith is the evidence of things not seen, is not really like what Francis described on the hill where somebody's shouting to you across the hill and you're having faith that it's true and jumping. That's hope. I'm hearing things. I've had experience with God in the past. I'm hoping that it's true and I'm going to make a step of hope, not of faith. But faith has evidence of things that are not seen. Evidence requires us to see them in the spirit. So when we don't see things in the spirit and we're looking at things in the physical realm, what are we really looking at? So I want to ask you this question. What is a shadow? How do you make a shadow? So in order to make a shadow, you shine light on an object at an angle and the shadow appears in the surface behind them. So if we're standing and we shine light at an angle, we'll see our shadow on the wall behind us. Or if you shine a light from above an object at an angle, the shadow will appear, appear on the surface below it. So when we're walking in the sunlight and the sunlight shines on us at an angle, then a shadow is cast behind us or beside us. What's the relationship between the object and the shadow? The shadow has roughly the shape of the object, but it can be distorted by the angle and by the atmosphere and also by the surface. So if you cast a shadow, shine a light on someone, cast a shadow, you'll see something that has the general shape of the object, maybe of us, but the shape can be distorted. When you, if, the, if the angle is, is wide, then you're going to look really tall. If the sun is high in the sky, then you're going to look really short. So there's a distortion by the angle that the light is shining. And also by the atmosphere, if there's a lot of junk in the air, then, then, then there'll be a distortion of the light. And also by the surface, if the surface is all wavy, then the shadow will be distorted by the surface. So I'm saying this because I'm, we're going to read Hebrews 8.1, and it talks about these things. And I want to just get in your mind, when we say shadow, what does it mean? It's not an accurate representation of the object. It's a version of the object, which is imperfect because of the angle, because of the atmosphere, the surface. And it doesn't have all the details. It doesn't have all the details. Hebrews 8, 1. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord has erected, and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. 
So the pattern that Moses was shown from the spiritual realm, he translated into a copy or a shadow of the heavenly thing he saw. He saw it in the spirit realm, and he had instructions of how to make a copy of it or something that would be a shadow of it in the physical realm. Hey, that's what this passage is telling us, that there's a real tabernacle in the real heaven, and Jesus and, and our high priest is seated there, and he's doing all the things that he does there. We ex People experience those things on the earth as a shadow and a copy. So we create, they, they created tabernacles, they created a temple in Judaism. They were a shadow and a copy of the real thing. Jesus is ministering in the sanctuary in the heavenly realm, in the spirit realm. The true tabernacle, which the Lord has erected, not a man. The earthly minister and structures are copies or shadows of the heavenly things. They're established based on a pattern revealed from the mountain, revealed from heaven. Okay. Even today, much of ministry of the church operates the same way. We extract the pattern from scripture and we create, we create a copy of it here on earth. This is good because we honor God by walking within the pattern, and that pattern contains a picture of reality. But because it's a copy of the real thing, every once in a while, the glory of the Lord is revealed in the copy. So there'll be times when we're in church or we're participating in a ministry that is operating from an earthly perspective. Because it was created using a pattern from Scripture, a pattern of, the, of heavenly things, then every once in a while, the glory of God will emerge within that copy, within that pattern. But this can also create a problem because the church becomes stuck within the copy of the real thing, thinking that it's the real thing. I know that happened to me, and many of you can will, will say, you know, it happened to me too. I was going to church. I was worshiping. I was participating. I was in ministry. I was learning. And then I got a revelation in the spirit. And all of a sudden, heaven's opened up, and now it's totally different. But until that happened, I was stuck in that copy. It's all I knew. I didn't know the real thing. I only knew the copy. I, did, I knew there was a heaven, but I didn't think it was accessible. And so I had to be satisfied with a copy until I died and went to heaven. Because that's the case, because we become blinded by the copy, thinking it's a real thing, we become blinded to the reality of the kingdom of God and we become enamored in the substitute. It takes a lot of energy and money to build and maintain a copy of the real thing erected by the hands of men. And as a result of that, the building of this substitute and this copy can become, the builders who put it all together and worked so hard for it can be vested in the preservation of the copy. They might even think that the copy is more important than the real thing. They probably will never say that. They'll probably never say this church is more important than the kingdom of heaven, but they act that way because they've been invested. They've put their life, their sweat, their blood, their time into the building of this copy. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong to build a church. I'm not saying it was wrong to build a tabernacle or a temple. I'm just saying we need to realize what it is. What is seen by those who are constrained to see from the physical realm is a copy and a shadow of what exists in the heavenlies. And the shadow of the object is distorted. It's sin distorted by the atmosphere around us, by the sin corruption on the surface in the physical realm. And so a lot of times people say, well, how can these things happen in church? People get hurt very deeply by what goes on in their church. How can these things happen? It's because you're living in a sin distorted copy a shadow of the real thing and you've invested all your time and energy in the copy and the shadow and it's corrupted by definition it's corrupted second corinthians 5 1 for we know that if our earthly house this tent is destroyed we have a building from god a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed we have been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, 
not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that morality might be swallowed up by life. Now he has prepared us for this very thing as God, who has also given us the spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We should no longer be constrained by what we see in the physical realm. It's shadows, copies, patterns projected from heaven. They're not bad things. They're just incomplete things. Instead, we should walk by faith, by spiritual sight, by seeing the spirit realm, by discerning the things from the heavenlies, by receiving revelation from the Holy Spirit in our human spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit is given to us as the guarantee. The Holy Spirit is a guarantee. How? Because the Holy Spirit lives within our spirit and opens up the opens up the heavenly realm to us allows us to see that this heavenly tent that Paul is talking about this building from God already exists we have a building not we were we will get a building someday when we die we have a building a house not made by hand eternal in the heavens it already exists so we have two tents we have an earthly tent and we have a heavenly building we're in both and the Holy Spirit is our guarantee because the Holy Spirit enables us to receive revelation into our human spirit that all of this is true. By faith, we do what we see the Father do. We say what we hear the Father say. Why? Because we are in our spiritual house. We are in the spiritual kingdom. By faith, we bring to heaven, we bring heaven to earth because we can see how the things of heaven fill up the shadows and substantiate the copies and patterns with spiritual reality. So the church and the ministry and all of these things, which are patterns and copies, are not bad things. They just need to be filled in. The details need to be filled in. How do we see the details? We see them in the spirit. We see them by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith gives us eyes to see the spiritual reality of the kingdom of God. Without faith, we can't see it. But when we have faith, along what the element, the spiritual element of that faith is spiritual sight, is the ability to participate in the things of the spirit realm. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, 2 Corinthians 5.7. We, are, we walk by faith, spiritual sight, not by sight. In our soul, faith is experienced as a sure trust and confidence in the object of our faith, a conviction of truth concerning the object of our faith, a firm persuasion that the object of our faith is reliable and can be trusted. This is as far from faith so-called as we can go when we're tied down to the body-soul existence. Those whose reference point is this, their reference point is a shadow and a copy of the real thing. These things are not bad because they are a shadow and a copy of the real thing. They are the manifestation of, of, of faith, of the fullness of faith in our soul. And they can carry us a long way. But that's not the end of faith for dual realm humans who sit in the heavenlies with Jesus. Faith has a component, a spiritual substance, they can only be seen and experienced by those who are spirit born. Those who walk by faith, spiritual sight, not by physical sight. We experience faith from our dual realm existence where we obtain by revelation of the Holy Spirit to our human spirit, the substance of things, not just the copies and shadows of things. Let me say that again. We experience faith in the spirit realm because we receive the substance of things not just the copies and shadows of things. So we start as body, soul, humans, looking at the shadows of things, looking at the pattern. Someone preaches the gospel and we hear it and we, be, and we the spirit move, is moving in our body and soul, in our soul, and we realize we need Jesus. And, and, and so we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's an act of our will, an act of our mind and our emotions. That's not all of faith. Doing that doesn't give us the ability to see in the spirit realm. We need what John 3 calls the spirit birth. 
when the spirit birth comes, then we get the spiritual component of faith, which Paul and Jesus talks about as spiritual sight. We have eyes to see and ears to hear. We can participate in the spirit realm. And therefore, things become substantial that before we could only see the copies of. These revelations in the spirit provide us with evidence of unseen things, which have substance in all of reality, both the physical realm and the spiritual realm. As such, we receive more of reality than those who have eyes to see, than those who do not have eyes to see and ears to hear. Now, so many Christians walk by faith without the spiritual component active. So they're really not walking by faith at all because they don't have the substance of things hoped for. They don't have the evidence of things not seen. They can walk in hope and they can walk in the little bit of faith that of things that have been revealed in the spirit. But in order for the things that we're experiencing in life, in order for us to have substance, for us to have faith in things that God's doing, we have to have substance. We have to see, see it in the unseen world. So, for example, when we're praying for someone, and during our prayer, we're in spirit, in the kingdom, and we see God heal, or we hear Jesus say, I'm healing this person, or I'm healing this today, then all of a sudden, that idea of God's healing becomes more than just an idea, more than just a conviction in our soul, more than just a, yes, we believe Jesus can heal, but we're not sure he will heal. It goes beyond that, because now, we have substance. We're measuring spiritual with spiritual. We're discerning in the spirit, and we're and we're have, and we're obtaining knowledge and revelation that God is healing today, even right now. And when we have that substance, now that is solid. We know it's going to happen, not because we're hoping for it, not just because the Bible said so, although that's part of faith, but we have sure trust and confidence because we've just received evidence from the spirit realm substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen the operation of our soul the operation of our spirit both sides have to be working for us to have biblical faith and when we when we're experiencing it based on what based on our soul that sure trust and conviction when we're experiencing based on our spirit, evidence of things not seen, now we have a greater picture of what's really going on. We have a, under, a greater understanding of, of reality and what's happening, not just in the kingdom of heaven, but on the kingdom of earth. We have faith that the things that we believe in, that we see, that we hear, that we have evidence of, that we have substance for, we have faith that it will happen and we'll bet everything on it. We'll bet our life on it. We'll bet everything on it because we're sure. It's not a maybe. It's not a maybe God will do it. It's a, I saw him do it in the spirit realm. And therefore, I know he will do it now. And all of it lines up. So I have a sure trust and confidence that he will do it. Let me go back to what John Wesley said. John Wesley said, faith is a sure trust and confidence that God has and will forgive our sins. He has accepted us again into his favor to the merits of his spirit of Christ's death and passion. That's faith operating in our soul. Faith is a divine supernatural evidence or conviction of things not seen, not discoverable by our bodily senses as being either past, future, or spiritual. There's no time in the spiritual dimension. So we can see things in the past. We can see things in the future. We can see all of these things in the spirit realm. That's the spiritual dimension of faith. In order to have faith that meets the definition of Ephesians 11, we have to have both sides. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen.